Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. Today was my birthday. It was a tradition to set up a barbecue bar and invite the whole world. Well, it wasn't that bad. Just family, friends and neighbors. Even though I thought it was my day, I always felt obligated to actively participate in the preparations. Do you want to get a birthday present right now? Or will you wait until the evening? The shower is warm and ready, Darla grinned. The nightgown was gone, and she was playing shy. See you tonight, little lady. Right now, I'll go downstairs and help the boys. I'll take a shower later. Todd was 18, and two months later he was leaving for Texas. Terry was a year younger and had already received a scholarship to Auburn. They were good sons, and I gave Darla credit for bringing them up right. We did a pretty good job in the yard and on the patio for a few hours, and then lit up some grills. Todd started the smokehouses, and Terry smeared dry butter all over the meat. Damn it, considering how things are going, I could probably sit back and let them take care of everything themselves. Darla showed up just as we were finishing the preparatory work. Her two sisters came to help her with all the extra things. More than 50 people will need to be fed today. It's funny how friends show up when there's free food. I was 40 years old, but I felt like I was 20, and next month Darla and I will celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. It was a good marriage. He seemed to have disappeared about a year ago, shortly after Darla started working. The fear of an empty nest pushed her out of the house. We didn't need the money, but she needed social interaction. The guys and I went to the shower. I had a new shirt just for the occasion, which my mother left at the beginning of the week. Darla wisely insisted that I wear an apron. It wasn't long before our guests started arriving. Some brought dishes with food, others, gifts, and others, soft drinks. The weather was fine, and the day promised to be beautiful. Darla looked great and, as always, was the perfect hostess. She'll turn 40 next year, but she'll pass for 30 without a problem. She kept her figure and appearance. I watched her flutter around the tables, making sure everything was in order. An ideal wife and an ideal mother. What more could a man want? I do not know where he came from, and I definitely did not recognize him. He was tall and wearing a dark blue jacket. He stopped at the edge of the party area, bent down and said something to one of the neighbors. She pointed at Darla. He thanked her and walked towards us. Darla noticed his approach and seemed a little embarrassed. Darla Connors? My wife nodded. He handed her an envelope, which he took from the inside pocket of his jacket. Darla Connors, you have received a notification. That's all. He turned and left as quietly as he had appeared. Of course, by this time, everyone at the party was already watching. Darla stood motionless. There was no emotion on her face. She looked at me, turned slowly, and walked back into the house. I didn't understand anything. The usual chatter of the guests turned into muffled murmurs and whispers. In a desperate attempt to break the spell of the moment, I screamed, Does anyone want more ribs? Come and take it. Todd and Terry came up to me. What the hell is going on, Dad? Terry tried to be restrained. I have no idea. I could only shrug my shoulders. Todd started toward the house, but I stopped him. Why don't you guys check if you need another beer or something to drink? When the conversation in the courtyard began to return to normal, I relaxed a little. After 10 minutes, I decided it was time to talk to my wife. But alas, Dad, Mom is leaving in a Mustang. Terry pointed to the front of the house. My black convertible Mustang was speeding down the street faster than it should have been. The backyard was quiet again as everyone watched her scurry away. Darla usually drove a minibus, but it was parked inside. The Mustang was at hand. There were a lot of unanswered questions, but I think they could have waited until my wife got home. After that, everything went downhill. Darla's sister, Peggy, brought the cake, and I made a feeble attempt to look happy. Without Darla, everything seemed like a cloud. Friends and neighbors were the first to leave. The families stayed a bit longer, but in the end there was nothing more to talk about. Surprisingly, Darla's sudden departure was not a topic of conversation. I was alone with my two sons, and the house was quiet. They were both looking at me, waiting for some sign or explanation. I had nothing to offer. I sat on the couch while they went to bed. I was still there in the morning. Todd and Terry got up early. The smell of fresh coffee made me get up from the couch. Darla didn't come back. 
Whatever was in that envelope must have been very important. I called her cell phone several times, but it was turned off. Of course, I stayed up half the night trying to figure out what was going on. The guys easily guessed that I wanted to be alone. A long hot shower helped, but not too much. There was almost nothing I could do on Sunday. Tomorrow I'll see if the police can help in any way. I don't know any cops or detectives, but I had a few friends in the courthouse. I hope they can help. We had one credit card and one debit card. The debit card was used for everyday things, and the credit card was used for larger purchases. If Darla is in trouble, she will have to use them. It took several days for credit card purchases to appear in a bank account, but debit payments were usually debited after a couple of hours. First, I checked the credit card activity and found nothing. A debit card is a completely different story. About two hours after Darla left the house, she bought gasoline at the Pennsylvania-Ohio border. Two hours later, she bought gasoline in Illinois, and the last transaction was an ATM in Cedar Rapids, where she withdrew $300. I was finishing my third cup of coffee when I realized she wasn't coming back. She wasn't just killing time. She was running away. I loved my wife and didn't want to hurt her, but I also didn't want to encourage her in what she was doing. Even though it was Sunday, I was able to cancel both cards in 10 minutes. About an hour later, I called the police and reported that my Mustang had been stolen. I didn't tell them that my wife took it. I explained that there was a debit card in the car and that it was used in three states in a westerly direction. I was ashamed to lie to the police, but I thought it was the only way to attract attention to myself. They seemed more interested in getting rid of me than in asking me about the circumstances. I did a quick inventory of the house, and the only things that seemed to be missing were her purse and a small bag. I had no idea what she put in there. I spent several hours wondering what to do with her cell phone. Since I canceled the cards, I hoped that would make her call home and explain everything. I still didn't have time to have lunch. Before I knew it, it was time for dinner, and my sons appeared with a couple of pizzas. There's a ton of food left over from yesterday, but I have to admit that the hot slices were delicious. Finally, we started talking about what had happened. I summarized what I knew to them, and they offered their support. That night I slept in my bed. Darla never called. I called work and took a week off. I was a little sick of this job, but it paid well. I was delivering gravel for one of the local quarries. It was hot and dirty, but there weren't many decisions to make. I just picked up the goods, took them away, unloaded them, and received my salary. Right after Darla started working at Prescott Casualty Company, we attended several corporate events. They had parties and picnics where I met the people she worked with. I've just realized that we haven't attended any more meetings in the last six months or so. In fact, she didn't even mention them. They were important to her when she started working at the company and then suddenly stopped. I don't remember the people I meet very well, but I remembered Bob and Margie Gilson. Bob was a carpenter and Margie worked in the same office as Darla. Margie, this is Brian Connor. Do you have a minute to talk? Hi, Brian. I'm very busy right now. Nothing important, I hope. Darla didn't come to work today, did she? No. In fact, we did not expect this. Oh, really? Why is that? There was a long pause on the other end of the line. It was obvious that Margie was uncomfortable talking to me. Brian, I don't think I want to discuss this with you. I think you should talk to your wife. I'd love to, but I have no idea where she is. There was another long pause. Brian, I'm sorry, but I have a lot of work to do. I have to go. Before I could say anything, she hung up. Suddenly, I had the feeling that something was going on that Darla didn't want me to know about. This explains why we no longer attended any corporate events. She was afraid that someone would accidentally say or do something that might give her away or make me believe that she was up to something bad. I grabbed a cold beer and went out on the porch to think. I've noticed something over the last few months but I didn't pay much attention to it. Darla started working overtime several nights a week. Not enough to wave red flags, but it has become commonplace. She stopped talking about work when she was at home, and we avoided talking to anyone from the company. On the other hand, she hadn't changed her appearance or her dress. She didn't buy any new clothes or fancy underwear. There were no suspicious phone calls or emails that I could remember. I trusted my wife. She didn't turn into a bitch at home and cut me off romantically. It was time to make some more phone calls. Donald Curry was an old school friend who worked in court. 
I didn't know what he was doing, but I knew he was connected to computers. I explained the problem to him and planned to meet with him when he returned from work. Before I left the house, I called a construction company and found out that Bob Gilson works in an apartment complex nearby. I planned to meet him right after lunch. When I arrived, the team was at lunch. Bob smiled and walked over to the car. He seemed much friendlier than Margie. Brian, it's good to see you. I suppose you want to talk about Darla. Bob, I talked to Margie this morning, and she refused to tell me what was going on. You have to let me know, man to man, without any nonsense. I liked Bob because he was a blue-collar guy like me, but if he tried to fool me, I'd get mad. Brian, I usually turn Margie off when she starts gossiping about work, but here's what I know. Darla has been messing around in the office with a married guy for almost six months now. They tried to keep it a secret, but it became common knowledge in the blink of an eye. Margie stopped talking to Darla when she found out about it, as did many other girls. We missed you at the corporate party, but we decided that Darla specifically wouldn't let you in. That's all. Do you know who this guy is? No. I'm not paying attention as I should be. I can find out. Don't worry about it, Bob. I'll take care of everything. That pretty much summed it up for me. There were no misunderstandings. It was just a stupid husband who had no idea what was going on in his own house. Ten minutes later, I canceled her cell phone. Now she couldn't call home. I was on my way home when I got a call on my cell phone. Cedar Rapids police found a Mustang parked in the bus station parking lot. It was towed to the impound lot, and I could pick it up at any time, paying $300. I stopped by the police station and was given a printout of the report. The only conclusion I could draw was that Darla had left the car and switched to the bus. I couldn't find out where she was going, but I assumed it was westerly. I didn't even know she had any acquaintances in the area. I went to the bank, closed all joint accounts and opened new ones only in my name. I changed the beneficiary in my insurance policies to boys. I drank quite a lot before Donald came. Brian. There was a divorce hearing today, and Darla was called to testify. Of course, she didn't show up. Marsha Ridgway divorced her husband Kelsey, using adultery as a reason. Mrs. Ridgway wanted Darla to testify that she was the woman with whom her husband committed adultery. So the divorce didn't take place without Darla's testimony? No. Everything went as planned. It appears that Mrs. Ridgway had photographs, videos, and taped phone calls that supported her claim. She didn't really need Darla's confession. I think she only called her to embarrass her. It seems to have worked. What is Darla's current situation? No one cares about that anymore. There is nothing new that she can contribute, and it doesn't matter. Kelsey Ridgway, more or less, confessed to everything after his wife's lawyer presented all the evidence. The judge granted the divorce claim on the spot. It becomes final in six months. He will receive large alimony payments to his wife and children. Does he have children? 3. All under the age of 10. He will pay for this mistake for a long time. Donald and I talked for a while. I thanked him for his help and asked the bartender for coffee. I drank a little too much, but I still managed to get home without killing myself or anyone else. It was stupid under the circumstances. I wrapped six ribs in foil and put them in the oven while I was taking a shower. Todd and Terry returned home and went straight to the pork. Todd was thrilled with the Mustang situation. After 20 minutes of discussion, I finally agreed to let both boys take the bus to Cedar Rapids and drive the car home. I gave them $600 to cover their expenses. Terry wrote a note on the computer in which I gave permission to pick up the car and take it home. He seemed to know what he was doing, so I kept my mouth shut and signed up. The next morning we all had breakfast at IHOP and I dropped them off at the bus station. I giggled a little when they boarded. They had no idea what it was like to spend two days on the Greyhound. It was a great life lesson. I called the Cedar Rapids Police Department to have them waiting there. They promised that there would be no problems. There was one more thing I had to take care of. It didn't take long to figure out where Kelsey Ridgway's office was. When Margie saw me, she immediately reached for the phone. But it was already too late. I didn't introduce myself, but just started hitting him on the head and shoulders. He made a few feeble attempts to defend himself, but ended up at his desk on the floor. I kicked him in the sex glands several times before the guards dragged me back. He turned into a bloody mess, and I felt much better. After that, events developed quickly. Before I knew it, I was at the police station, in front of a judge, 
and on my way to the county jail. There was no trial, just the judge and me. I got 60 days and I didn't give a damn. At the first opportunity, I called the guys to bring them up to date. I could have sworn I heard Terry laughing on the phone. The house could be left empty for a few days. Well, it wasn't exactly the way it was shown on TV. I mean, it wasn't a walk in the park, but I didn't feel like my life was on the line or that I was going to be raped at any moment. It was mostly a bunch of nasty farts who couldn't play well with others and a bunch of stupid kids. Children and farts hardly talked. There was no question of a separate camera. I ended up sharing a cell with a 300-pound gorilla named Jocko, who beat up his wife when he caught her in bed with his brother. I didn't know what happened to my brother. Jocko and I got along great. Of course, I took the top bunk. The food in the dining room was heavier than I liked, and Jocko was more than willing to help me with what I didn't want to eat. Aside from the fact that he farted more than any other man in the state, he was the perfect roommate. Three days later, Terry and Todd paid me a visit. The car restoration trip went great, but they weren't expecting any bus trips in the near future. They had no information about Kelsey or her mother. They brought me two packs of cigarettes, even though I don't smoke. Todd said he considers them valuable for trading. He's seen too many movies. Jocko, however, was overjoyed when I gave them to him. He said he needed to smoke to lose weight. I had no difficulty leaving the boys alone in the house. Todd left for school a week before I got out of prison. He got into the van and left the Jeep with Terry. Terry and I celebrated my homecoming by going to the Red Lobster. He was thrilled to start his senior year in high school. Unfortunately, he had to go through this without me. I had other plans. Margie couldn't believe her eyes when I walked past her desk the next morning. I winked at her and headed back to Kelsey's office. Three hours later, I was on the bus back to the county jail. This time for six months. Terry thought it was funny and he immediately called his brother at College Station. Jocko greeted me with open arms. I handled Kelsey better this time. I even feel like I've broken something. Of course, I've never received any feedback, so I can't know for sure. I was fired from my job, a big surprise. There was enough money stashed away to pay for the house and cover living expenses. Terry took care of everything without any problems. Besides Terry, all the other members of my family came to see me regularly. Terry made sure that I always had cigarettes for Jocko. Both of Darla's sisters came to visit and expressed their sympathy. Neither they nor anyone else in the family had heard anything about Darla. We actually had a family Thanksgiving and Christmas celebration in prison. I still had a month left when I lost Jocko. In fact, I didn't lose it, as it was released before me. His wife and brother had gone to Florida, and he had no idea what he was going to do. Terry thought it would be great to have Jocko as a guest until he settled in. He offered him a job at a tree pruning company, but Jocko decided to move south, where it was warmer. To Florida, I think. The night before Jocko's departure, Kelsey Ridgeway was found beaten to a pulp in an alley in the city center. He told the police that he was attacked by a monkey. I thought it was funny because I had an ironclad alibi. After I was released, I decided that I had had enough of Kelsey's flesh. In fact, he no longer worked in the area, and I didn't want to look for him. I took a course to learn how to operate large drilling rigs. It wasn't much harder than the dump trucks I was used to. I had to kill a few months before Terry got into Auburn, so I took the time to renovate the house. I wanted to sell it, but it was in my and Darla's names, and I didn't want any extra trouble. No one has heard a word from Darla since she ran away. Terry took the Mustang with him to Alabama because it was a chick magnet. I found a couple who were willing to buy a house with a cloud over it. I wasn't sure what that meant, but they got a good discount on the price. Their lawyer assured them that Darla's signature was not needed, and I was not going to argue with him. I just wanted to get out of it, freely and clearly. I used the down payment to buy a drilling rig with a sleeper. Before I knew it, I was on the road and free. I never bothered to file for divorce from Darla because I never saw the need for it. I wasn't interested in getting married again. You don't meet many interesting women in prison, and Jocko rejected me from the alternative. It looks like Darla wasn't going to divorce me either, because I didn't get any surprise in the mail. I didn't have any problems getting a job. I wasn't desperate for money, so I could be a little choosy in my searches. It didn't take me long to learn the tricks of this craft, and I really enjoyed my new life. Things got interesting while I was delivering a load of agricultural machinery to South Dakota. 
It was June, so there were no problems with the weather. I dropped the load and headed south, about five miles off Highway 90, when I stopped at the Belly Up Diner. I just told the waitress to bring home her favorite dish and coffee. Three large televisions were showing three different programs that no one was actually watching. The one closest to me was showing mostly political ads, and one of them caught my attention. John Hemingway ran for the U.S. House of Representatives. He was good-looking and seemed to have a silver tongue. Next to him, dressed as Jackie Kennedy, with a big smile on her face, stood his new wife, Darla My Darla. My thoughts were disrupted when the largest hash plate I've ever seen plopped down in front of me. That's it, big boy. Is there anything else you need? Who is this woman standing next to the clever talker? Betsy the waitress snorted slightly. This is Hemingway's new candy. He needed a wife to run for president. There were rumors that he wasn't straight, if you know what I mean. I started dumping Tabasco on the hash pile. She looks a little old to be a candy. I guess you can't be too picky when you're in a hurry. However, she's pretty, and I think older women make the best lovers, don't they? Darla looked really good. Her blonde hair was now brown and looked like it had been styled in a fashionable salon. Her makeup was flawless, and her dress fit her like a glove. It wasn't really a dress, but rather a tailored suit. I looked up from the TV and noticed that the waitress had returned to work. The hash was great, and it was easy to see why the parking lot was full. My coffee cup was filled twice before I put the plate away. The pie looked good, but I didn't have any space left. Betsy took my empty plate and put the check in front of me. Will he win the election? He's got a lot of money behind him from powerful people in Sioux Falls. None of the locals want anything to do with him, but we don't have the votes or the money to stop him. I smiled as I pulled out the money clip. You know something, don't you? Are you sure they got married? Yeah. They actually did it on TV, like it was a reality show or something. But no honeymoon. They said they were waiting until he took office. I was smiling when I dropped a tenner on the counter. Mister, you better tell me something before you walk out the door. I'm not looking for trouble, and I'm not sticking my nose where it shouldn't be. However, I would like to ask you a favor. Which one? Can I sleep for a couple of hours here in the yard before I get on the highway? No problem, but beware of these cheaters. They sneak up here from time to time. They are filthy, disgusting creatures. I nodded my thanks and left. Betsy watched from the window as I climbed into the car. I was just starting to enjoy a well-deserved nap when there was a knock on the door. I ignored him for a few moments, but he didn't stop. Go away. I was allowed to park for a couple of hours. Whoever it was, he didn't leave, and I had to open the door. Betsy said I needed to talk to you. Do you have a few minutes? It was dark. It was raining. All I could see was a stern-looking woman in a poncho. I didn't break any laws. Leave me alone. Just give me ten minutes. She looked and sounded determined. I'm sorry, lady. I'm not interested in that. Go get one of the other guys. I'm not a cheater, damn it. I need to talk to you about Hemingway. I'll meet you inside in ten minutes. That seemed to calm her down. She smiled slightly as she closed the door. Maybe it would have been better to just let her get into the car, even though she was soaked through. Pulling out my raincoat, I looked at my watch. I only managed to sleep for three hours. There was still a decent crowd in the restaurant. She was sitting in a booth by the window with two cups of coffee. Her hair was straight, shiny, black, with a small white streak on one side. She wasn't really anywhere near a girl. She was at least 35, maybe 40. The whole look was rounded, with high cheekbones and no makeup. I held out my hand and sat down. Brian Connors. Sally Wilmot. Do you want to eat something? No, thanks. I ate three hours ago. She replied with a polite smile. Betsy said you might know something about Darla Hemingway. I wanted to talk to you before you left. What the hell is so important about Darla Hemingway? My brother Franklin is running against him in the election. Franklin represents the people in the area. Farmers, ranchers, and Native Americans. Hemingway is supported by businessmen from Sioux Falls. We are not against business, but we do not feel that the locals will be treated fairly if Hemingway is elected. Okay, but I still don't understand what his wife has to do with all this. We don't know either. All we know is that something is wrong. Our election commission tried to check her biography, but found nothing. People from his campaign have not disclosed any information about her. Maybe it's nothing, but we're getting desperate, 
and Betsy said, maybe you know something. I think it's better for me not to become a professional poker player if the waitress reads me so easily. She leaned back in her chair. Ah, she was right. You really know something. Are you going to tell me? Or am I going to have to beat it out of you? I finished my coffee and grinned. I found her choice of words funny. In fact, it was just ridiculous. I waved my empty cup at Betsy and leaned forward. I think I like the second option better. I have no idea what came over me. It was not in my nature to be clever or to resort to hints, probably because I liked her behavior. She was self-confident and straightforward. I had the feeling that she always knew what she wanted and knew how to achieve it. Betsy refilled her coffee and Sally Wilmot stared at me. I'm really sorry. It was rude and impolite of me. I will answer any questions. Sally covered her mouth with her hand and laughed softly. It's all right, Mr. Connors. I'm not that sensitive, and I thought your answer was sweet. I shouldn't have asked that question the way I did. Oh, good. This means that the second option is still open. No, damn it. How do you know Darla Hemingway? She's my wife. We have been married for over 20 years and have never divorced. I haven't seen her in a few years, but unless she's divorced somewhere I'm not aware of, we're still married. Sally seemed at a loss for words. She didn't say anything at all. She just sat there and looked at me. And what maiden name did she use when she got married? She hesitated for a few seconds before speaking. Oh my God. Her maiden name was Connors. She didn't even try to hide it. Ooh. Of course, Betsy came running and all the heads in the hall turned to us. I was a little embarrassed by the attention, but Sally seemed delighted. Sally jumped up and kissed Betsy right on the lips. She walked through the foyer and took out her cell phone. Betsy blushed slightly and leaned towards me. What the hell did you tell her? I haven't seen her this excited in five years. The smart ass that had been hiding in me for many years began to show up. I looked at Betsy and said, I told her that you and I were going to get married. She immediately realized that this was a joke, and I was rewarded with a punch on the arm. So you're going to tell me? No, let Sally tell you herself. I'm going to go back to my setup and see if I can get back to work. Nice to meet you, Betsy. The rain stopped, but I never got to the rig. Sally grabbed my arm before I was halfway there. You can't leave yet. You need to talk to Franklin. It won't take long, just a few minutes. I would really like to give up all this. Now I regret saying anything. How long will it take him to get here? He's going to meet us at my place. Do you want to come with me? Or will you go in your truck? I'll follow you. The Jeep van Sally was driving was 10 years old, maybe more. After a couple of miles of rubble, we found ourselves on a worn gravel road leading to an equally worn trailer. Someone was there because the room was well lit. There was no lawn, only gravel, and even then a little. I tried to stay away from the dirt, but it was difficult. There were no other cars nearby, so I assumed Franklin was on his way. There was a place for wet coats and boots just outside the trailer door. It looked like a good idea, especially because there were already a lot of coats and boots there. It was an interesting layout, mainly because it looked more like a classroom than a living room. There were desks instead of the end tables. There were computers instead of desk lamps, and three teenagers were looking right at me. Hi guys, this is Brian. He's here to help Uncle Franklin. Sally went straight to the kitchen and started making coffee. Instead of saying hello, I nodded slightly to my listeners. Under the circumstances, I felt a little awkward. I looked around the room, but saw nothing to indicate the presence of Mr. Wilmot. Having two sons, it was easy for me to notice that the boys were close in age. I assumed they were 16, 17, and 18. There was no TV, no music. All three of them seemed to be either sitting at a computer or reading a book. The strange thing was that they didn't look like scribes or nerds but looked like normal, strong, and active children. Brian, these are my sons. The oldest is Tracy, the next is Tyler, and the youngest is Tanner. They took turns smiling and nodding at me. I couldn't help but grin to the point where my amusement became obvious. I know. It's a little weird that we gave them names that all start with the letter T. No, no, it doesn't amuse me. I just have two sons, Todd and Terry. I thought it was a damn strange coincidence. Tyler spoke first. Where are your sons? The question drew a stern look from his mother, which he seemed to ignore. Todd works at the University of Texas, and Terry works at Auburn. 
This simple statement lit up the whole room. Suddenly, Tracy came alive, as if an energizer rabbit had hit him. I'm leaving for College Station in August. How long has he been there? What is he studying? Sally finally touched his shoulder. Slow down, boy, slow down. I'm sure Mr. Connors will have time to answer all your questions. As it turned out, Tracy had a full football scholarship, and he had already enrolled in RODC. Tyler was accepted into the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis and left a year later. Sally's husband served in the National Guard and died in the Gulf five years ago. She didn't go into details, and I didn't insist. Tanner, the youngest of the boys, had not yet decided what he wanted to do, but his mother made sure that he studied regularly. I had no idea what had delayed Franklin, but for the next hour, I was busy talking to Sally's sons. Sally just stood on the sidelines and watched me communicate with them, just like I communicated with my own. Talking to Sally's children made me realize how much I miss my boys. Finally, Franklin Honeycutt arrived with two assistants. After the performance, Sally got the boys back to work, and the adults gathered around the kitchen table. Apparently, they had some doubts that I was Darla's husband, and it wasn't important enough for me to get into an argument about it. As I was about to leave, I thanked Sally for the coffee and told the guys that I was glad to meet them. Sally wasn't involved in this. Damn it, Brian, sit down. Sally took over the conversation as if she were the one running for president. Brian, do you have a marriage certificate or something to prove that you were married to Darla Hemingway? It only took me a few seconds to pull the wedding photo out of my wallet. She was older now, and her hair was different, but it was still obvious that it was Darla. I looked at one of Franklin's henchmen, who was holding a laptop in front of him. Go to the archives of Berks County, Pennsylvania. You should be able to log into the marriage registration system from 1960 to 1990. Just find my name, Brian William Connors. Sally brought me a fresh cup of coffee and smiled slightly. She seemed glad that I hadn't left. August 17, 1979, right? Franklin seemed a little happier now. I nodded and took a sip of fresh coffee. Good luck finding any divorce records. As far as I know or anyone else knows, I'm still married. Feel free to explore all of this as much as you want. It doesn't make any difference to me. The conversation became a little superfluous and a little boring. No one stopped me this time. Do you mind if I get some sleep before I leave? No, not at all. Sally walked me to the door. I looked back to say goodbye to Franklin and his cronies, but they were deeply absorbed in what the politicians were doing. The boys waved or nodded at me as I left. An hour later, I heard Franklin and his band leaving. I decided I could finally get some sleep when I heard the knock on the door again. Sally jumped into the cab in a flannel nightgown. She put her finger to her mouth, indicating that she didn't want me to talk. We were far enough away from home that the boys couldn't hear anything, but I think she just didn't want to talk. She spent at least an hour with me in the sleeping car. It was passionate and loving, but a little uncomfortable. The rig cabin device is great for sleeping the driver, but that's it. I did everything I could under the circumstances. She left as quietly as she had come. Not a word was spoken. The sun had already risen when the door began to make noise again. It was Tanner. He told me to go inside for breakfast. Fortunately, boys and men like the same food, and Sally knew how to cook it. I spent another hour chatting with the guys and felt pretty comfortable. Comfortable enough to ask Sally for permission to take a warm shower before leaving. An hour later, I was finally on my way but not for long. It was the local sheriff who stopped me before I got to the highway. Looks like Mr. Honeycutt needed to talk to me some more. I had to follow the police car back to the belly, where Franklin was waiting for me. He was just having breakfast and invited me to join him. Betsy brought me coffee and took the opportunity to wink. She must have been a closer friend of Sally's than I thought. It seems Franklin's lawyers wanted me to stay. I used the old hackneyed phrase, time is money, to discourage him but he just laughed and kept eating. It would be very easy to agree to everything and then just run away, but I decided that I might want to stay for a few more days, especially after last night. The company would pay for the motel room and food, but that was all they could do. It was a good opportunity for me to wash my clothes and catch up on paying bills and banking transactions. The Wi-Fi is excellent. I sent the guys a couple of emails and paid all the bills. I was just getting a second helping out of the dryer when Sally came in, I don't think I've ever seen a woman who looked better in jeans. 
She had three children and a beautiful body. Her blue Oxford shirt was not tucked in, but belted with a silver belt. Her skin shone with a natural radiance. She was a damn attractive woman. What the hell are you doing here, Brian? I shrugged my shoulders innocently. I'm folding the laundry. You should have left. You said you were leaving this morning. Everything has changed. Your brother asked me to stay for a few more days. I only came to see you last night because I thought you wouldn't be here today. I can't keep you here after that. She struggled to find the words. She didn't seem to expect any kind of relationship other than one night and had no idea how to handle it. I was amused by her confusion and I considered it a reason for some fun. After talking to Franklin this morning, I'm seriously thinking about buying a house and staying here forever. Now I recognize bullshit by the smell. What is really going on? I sat Sally down on a bench next to the dryers. Your brother insisted that I stay for a few more days until they come up with something that would help me go after Hemingway. I promised to stay away from you and the boys until he gets it done. I didn't want to embarrass you or do anything that would make you feel uncomfortable. That's not the problem, Brian. The boys like you. They wanted to know when you could come back. They were a little upset when I told them you were leaving. Tyler wanted me to talk to you about staying a little longer. I'm really sorry. I was just trying to be friendly. They reminded me of mine, and it was easy for me to talk to them. I didn't want to cause you any problems. Of course, I didn't make it any easier for you when I came to your truck last night. You've definitely complicated things. This hint brought a poke in the arm and a smile. Why did you come? Sally shrugged and looked a little embarrassed. I'm not sure. It's been five years since my husband died. Five years without any solace or passion. It just seemed like a great opportunity, especially since you were supposed to leave today. She started getting mad at me again. Why the hell didn't you leave? I picked up a stack of folded laundry, handed it to her, and then grabbed the rest before returning to my motel room. She hesitated at the door for a moment until I put my finger to my lips, as she had done last night. Her shy smile turned into a wide smile as she closed the door behind her. It's much easier to make love to a woman in a normal bed. However, I liked the shower the most. Even the hot water didn't stop us. Before she left, she made me promise to be home for dinner at 6 o'clock. How could I refuse? I was ready. Damn, I've already showered twice today. Dinner at Sally's became a regular occurrence, and Betsy became my main ally. Betsy and Sally have been friends since childhood. Betsy was very happy to tell me about what they did when they were younger. Talking about Sally's husband was sad and far from frivolous, but it gave me a good idea of who Sally was and why I wanted to get to know her better. I never intended to stay in South Dakota, but the longer I was here, the more I wanted to stay. By the end of the first week, all the guys had Texas A and M t-shirts and Auburn sports shirts. Sally kept one of the Auburn shirts for herself. Anyway, it was too big for Tanner. I didn't pay much attention to political issues. Franklin and his team seemed to be doing just fine without me. Anyway, the press found out about Darla's dark past and started playing on it. Hemingway's people tried unsuccessfully to do nothing. The more they denied it or ignored it, the worse it got. His popularity began to plummet. I never interfered with anything until I got a visit at the motel early one morning. The woman at my door was tall, blonde, and straight as a pole. I was wearing boxers, but I invited her in anyway. She avoided looking at me as I pulled on the 501st, but I watched her every move. She was wearing a dark suit with a white shirt and low black heels definitely a professional in her field. My name is Mary Beth Steinmetz. I'm a lawyer from the Levitz Brothers in Sioux Falls. I assume you're Brian William Connors? She knew my middle name. It wasn't good. Excuse me for a moment. I got up and went to the bathroom. Although I closed the door, I was sure that the noise I made when my water got into the toilet was noticed. I was going to be patient for a while, but I felt that this pompous fool needed to humiliate herself a little. Less than a minute later, I returned to the table. Our company represents the interests of John Hemingway. We recently learned that your marriage to Darla Connors was never properly terminated, and we hope to fix this problem. How? There are laws in the state that allow for quick dissolution of marriages under certain circumstances. We believe that we can take advantage of these statutes with your cooperation. Do you want me to divorce my wife? Yes. Why would I do that? She seemed puzzled. I don't think she expected such an answer. At the moment, 
I would be happy to get a divorce, but on my own terms, and I didn't want her to know about it. Miss Steinmetz just sat there and looked at me. Miss Steinmetz, would you be so kind as to explain to me in unprofessional terms why my wife and I no longer live together? Don't embellish and be completely honest. If you can do that, I'll think about continuing our conversation. She leaned back and undid the top button of her blouse. Three years ago, your wife had an affair with a colleague. When you found out about it, she ran away because she couldn't look you or her sons in the eye anymore. She hasn't spoken to any of you since. Is that clear enough for you? That's good. It's a fact that you've hit the nail on the head. So what's the problem? If you follow the news, you know that Darla and Mr. Hemingway got into a little trouble. We cannot undo what has been done, but we hope to make it a little easier. By arranging a quick divorce for her? That's right. And tell me again. What do I get out of this? Freedom. Damn it. I'm happy with the way things are right now. How will my life be better? What do you want, Mr. Connors? Do you need money? How much? Give me something to discuss. What terms of divorce do you propose? There are none. That's why it can be done so quickly. Neither money changes hands, nor assets that need to be divided, nor problems with storage. You both walk away with what you have at the moment, and neither of you owes the other anything. The deal is clean and final. How long will it take? Less than 90 days. So it will end before the election? Yes, I hope so. She admitted it, but she didn't want to play along. Should I see my wife? No. In fact, we'd rather you didn't do that. Do I have to stay here until this is over? The question made her sigh. Yes. Okay. I will agree to this on one condition. You have to pay for my room and board. Mary Beth Steinmetz suddenly had a smile on her face. I could tell it was better than she'd hoped. I could probably hook her up for a lot of money, but right now just getting free sounded good. I can't prepare the papers for your signature this afternoon. Will it be okay? That's fine. I will have to consult with my lawyer, but I don't think there will be any problems. I didn't have a lawyer, but I wanted to talk to Franklin first. Your lawyer? Give me a business card. I promise to call if he doesn't like something. If you don't get a call, bring the papers. When she drove off, I saw Sally on the other side of the parking lot. Before I could wave to her, she was running down the road. After a hasty shave, I got dressed and headed to the belly up. Betsy looked at me sternly with a cup of coffee. Do I have a chance to explain? Not for me, Mr. Connors. But you better have a good story for Sally. Breakfast was hot, but the company was cold. I finished as quickly as I could and called Franklin. He was out of town, but we managed to talk for about 20 minutes. He was delighted with the whole situation and told me to agree, but made sure I had copies of all the documents. He spoke as if he was in control of the situation, no matter which way it turned. I asked him to call Sally. Sally parked right outside the door to my room. She got out of the Jeep when I pulled up and looked a little embarrassed. It was easy to tell from her expression that Franklin had called her. For the next two hours, she apologized to me in every possible way. Sometimes feeling guilty is good and pleasant. She had already left when Miss Steinmetz returned with the papers I had to sign. For some reason, she also made me accept a check for $10,000. Hemingway's campaign continued to go downhill, but my divorce petition went through the entire legal system. Tracy was in College Station, and he now had a friend who looked after him. I officially got divorced just before the election. Franklin won and promised to repay me for my help. I told him I would let him if he would give me his sister. It gave me another punch in the arm from Sally. Darla wasn't doing very well. After the election, someone decided to accuse her of bigamy anyway. Before they could do anything, she just disappeared. She was good at it. I didn't see or talk to her. I sold the truck and bought a house and a small gravel pit near Huron. Sally and I got married on Christmas Day, and all my five T-boys were there. Betsy moved into Double Wide and promised to take good care of him. The ultrasound showed that we are going to have a girl. Does anyone know good girls' names that start with the letter T?